fat is bad for you, particularly saturated fat, and you need to be eating less of it starting now. Or wait, is it fat is good for you and you need to start eating more of it starting now? Hey, I'm Dr. Jesse Abend, and in this video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about fat because most of us really don't know anything about it at all. So in this video, I break down fat to its fundamentals so that you can understand the basic science and purpose of fat and make your own decisions when it comes to eating it. After watching this video, you'll become a fat expert. Well, not a fat expert, you know, an expert in fat. So let's begin. Fat is one of the three main macronutrients, the other two being protein and carbohydrates. These three macronutrients together is what makes up the majority of the food we eat. Hence the name macro, meaning large. Now, different foods have different amounts and ratios of these macronutrients. Foods like meat provide mixtures of primarily proteins and fats, while other foods like grains such as oats and whole wheat are primarily carbohydrates. Foods such as beans, nuts, and seeds can provide mixtures of all three of these macronutrients. Now, it's important to note that in addition to these macronutrients, there are also micronutrients or small nutrients, such as vitamins and minerals that are also found in variable amounts in different types of foods. Now, the reason I'm telling you about macro and micronutrients before I specifically get into fat is because it's really important that we understand just what food really is before we start breaking it down into its individual components. So now that we understand this, let's get specifically into fat. Now, fat is a very special nutrient because it has many unique functions in the human body. The most common function that we all tend to hear about is how fat provides us with energy. Now, our bodies need a certain amount of energy to survive, maintain our weight, and do physical and mental things. This energy is often referred to as calories, and we get this energy or calories from the food we eat. Now, fat, carbohydrates, and even protein can all provide us with calories or energy. But what makes fat special is that it contains more calories than both carbohydrates and protein. You see, one gram of fat contains nine calories, while one gram of carbohydrates or protein only contain four. This means fat can give us a lot more for a lot less, making it the most efficient energy source. Now, it's this special property that gives fat maybe its most unique function of all, which is that our body uses fat as its preferred energy storage, or basically as its piggy bank, but for energy. Now, most of us are overweight, or to put it bluntly, fat. Now, before you get down on yourself, there is a survival benefit to having extra fat on us. Although, unfortunately, most of us now have a little too much, which is associated with disease. But the reason our body stores fat is because it essentially acts like an energy bank. When we eat excess food, we take in extra calories or energy that we don't need at the moment. Our body doesn't let anything go to waste, so it turns this extra energy into adipose tissue otherwise known as body fat. This specialized tissue or body fat is made up of adipocytes, which are specialized cells that store and contain essentially pockets of fat. In times of starvation or when food is scarce, our body can then dip into our fat bank and break down the fat to use as energy to continue to keep us alive during these tough times. In addition, body fat also functions to provide us with consistent energy during prolonged periods of exercise. Now, the reason our body chooses fat as its main energy bank over carbohydrates or protein is because of what I mentioned earlier, which is that it can essentially get more energy out of one gram of fat than it can out of carbohydrates and protein. Fat can also be stored in almost an unlimited quantity compared to carbohydrates and protein whose stores are much more limited. Now, in addition to fat being used as energy, 
Fat also has many other functions as well. Fat or adipose tissue provides insulation and cushioning for our organs, which helps regulate our body temperature. Because fat is an excellent insulator, it can help keep our organs warm in cold temperatures. Fat, the molecule, is used to make several important hormones, such as estrogen and testosterone, and is necessary for their production. Fat is an essential component of the brain, and it is necessary for the proper development and function of the nervous system. Fat makes up a significant portion of the myelin sheath which is essentially the cushion that surrounds and protects nerve cells. And it is also involved in the production of neurotransmitters that regulate mood, appetite, and sleep. Certain vitamins, such as vitamins A, D, E, and K, are fat soluble, which means that they require fat in order to be properly absorbed and utilized by the body. Fat helps to transport these vitamins from the digestive tract to the liver, where they are stored and distributed to other tissues as needed. Fatty acids are an important component of cell membranes or the outer layer of our cells, and they help to regulate the flow of electrolytes and neurotransmitters in and out of cells. This is essential for proper nerve function and communication between cells. Fat is also important for maintaining healthy skin and it helps keep skin supple and moisturized. And it also provides a protective barrier against external factors such as UV radiation, pollutants, and bacteria. So these are just some of the many important roles that fat has in our body, other than just providing us with energy, which is what makes fat such an essential and incredible nutrient. So now that we understand the overall functions of fat, let's learn about the three types of fat, which include saturated fat, unsaturated fat, and trans fat. So let's start off with the most controversial of all fats, which is saturated fat. Saturated fat is commonly found in meat and dairy products, such as beef, pork, butter, and cheese. It's also found in some plant-based sources as well, such as coconut oil and palm oil. Processed foods such as baked goods and fried foods also often contain high amounts of saturated fat. What makes saturated fat unique is that unlike oils, it is a solid at room temperature and it is this property that makes it useful in cooking and food processing. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Fats, including saturated fats, are very important and necessary for our health. However, there has been a lot of controversy surrounding saturated fat, and most people, including many experts and authorities, believe that saturated fat can actually be harmful to our health, particularly our heart. This is a main reason why many people believe that we should focus on consuming a lot less red meat and meat in general, along with other foods that contain higher amounts of saturated fat. However, there is an other side to the scientific debate that says saturated fat isn't as bad as we once thought. Now to get closer to the truth and figure out which side is right, let's go back into history and learn why saturated fat started getting a bad reputation in the first place. So back in the 1950s, heart disease, including heart attacks, were on the rise in America and other Western countries. And in order to understand why this was occurring, nutrition and health research at that time started investigating how diet, more specifically fat and cholesterol, was affecting the heart. One extremely influential research study done at this time by American physiologist Ansel Keys was called the Seven Countries Study. And this study essentially collected and compared dietary and health data from thousands of men in seven countries, including the United States, Finland, Italy, Greece, the Netherlands, Japan, and Yugoslavia. The findings of this study showed that heart disease rates were highest in countries with the highest intake of saturated fats and the lowest in countries with the lowest intake of saturated fats. They also found that heart disease rates were higher in men with high cholesterol as well. Because of these findings, this study almost single-handedly revolutionized and reshaped public 
health policy around the world regarding saturated fat intake. In the 1960s, the American Heart Association for the first time ever recommended that all people should decrease their consumption of saturated fats in order to protect against heart disease. Later on in 1980, this advice was then adopted by the United States government as official policy for all Americans and then later by governments all around the world, including the World Health Organization. Although this study and the movement that followed it was completely revolutionary, it was not without controversy. Many critics of this study have argued that there were many shortcomings and flaws with the way Ansel Keys conducted his research and some say that he even cherry-picked his results. Some critics state that the study did not adequately account for other factors that could influence heart disease risk, such as smoking, exercise, and alcohol consumption, and that the dietary data used in the study was incomplete and unreliable, as it relied on food frequency questionnaires rather than actual measurements of food intake. The study was also an observational one, which means that it could only show associations and therefore could not establish cause and effect relationships. Since then, many studies and analyses have been done and continue to be done showing conflicting evidence on whether or not saturated fat increases the risk of heart disease, continuing to make this one of the most heavily debated topics in the world of nutrition. Now, in my opinion, I don't think it's generally ever appropriate to put the blame on just one individual type of nutrient because all nutrients have their particular benefits and functions and nutrients are always accompanied by a complex web of other nutrients in the foods we eat. So what I mean by this is that when you demonize one nutrient and that nutrient happens to be found in more of an abundance in certain types of foods, you then end up demonizing those foods without taking into account all the other important nutrition and health benefits that those foods may have to offer. Take, for example, one of the now most controversial of all foods, meat. Because meat tends to have higher concentrations of saturated fat, and saturated fat is often thought of as bad, this now means meat is bad. But meat, in fact, is extremely nutritious, offering almost if not all, the essential nutrients we need to survive. It's an extremely nutrient-dense food without any processing or additives. And if you even get it from grass-fed, grass-finished, humane sources, you're now getting food that's responsibly, sustainably, and ethically raised. Now that's not to say that you can't eat meat in excess. And I think that's really where the biggest problem lies in nutrition and in health, is simply eating in excess. And this is a problem we should be focusing on and talking about the most, not necessarily individual nutrients like saturated fat. See, anything in excess is unhealthy and ultimately leads to disease. Meat is an extremely nutritious food, but in excess will likely lead to disease. Same thing with basically every other food. If you eat too much of anything, it will always end up being a bad thing and harming your health. So I know I went on quite the tangent there, but I did just want to spend some extra time on saturated fat since it's such a generally misunderstood and controversial topic. Now, before I end on saturated fats, I just want to also make you aware that there are different types of saturated fats as well. I won't go into too much detail, but essentially know that there are short chain, medium chain, and long chain saturated fats. These fats differ by their chemical structure, and this is what gives each of them their unique chemical properties. So now let's move on to the more loved fat and socially acceptable fat, unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fat, unlike its evil sibling, saturated fat, has been more widely accepted and promoted in mainstream diet culture. But the truth is, unsaturated fat is just like all the other nutrients, including saturated fat, in that it has its unique health functions, uses, and benefits, but moderation is always key. There are two types of unsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. Monounsaturated fats are found in foods like olive oil, avocados, 
nuts, and seeds, while polyunsaturated fats are found in foods like fatty fish and nuts and seeds as well. Polyunsaturated fats are interesting and they are further subdivided into omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 fatty acids. Omega-3s and omega-6s being the most well-known of these subtypes. Omega-3 and omega-6 polyunsaturated fats play many important roles in various bodily processes, including brain function, cell growth, and inflammation. The omega-3 fats include ALA, EPA, and DHA. EPA and DHA omega-3 fatty acids are essential, which means that our body cannot produce them on its own and we have to get them from our diet. They are necessary for a range of important functions in our body, such as brain function, blood clotting, and the production of anti-inflammatory molecules. Good sources of essential fatty acids, EPA and DHA, include fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, and sardines. Although plant-based foods such as flax seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts provide the other omega-3 fatty acid, ALA, which can be converted by our body into EPA and DHA, our body may not be able to convert it very effectively. This means that for vegans or those who don't consume fish, you may want to consider supplementing EPA and DHA outside of your diet. Omega-6 fatty acids are another type of polyunsaturated fat that are also essential for human health. They play various roles in the human body, including maintaining healthy skin and hair, regulating metabolism, and supporting the immune system. The two main types of omega-6 fatty acids are linoleic acid, or LA, and arachidonic acid, or AA. LA is an essential fatty acid, meaning that we have to get it from our diet, and it is found in foods such as vegetable oils, nuts and seeds, some whole grains, and dark beefy greens. It is important to note that the Western diet, or standard American diet, tends to be high in omega-6 fats and low in omega-3s, simply because we tend to eat more processed foods, which is why you'll often hear authorities and experts recommend improving your omega-6 to your omega-3 ratio, which essentially just means we need to incorporate more whole foods like fresh fish, meat, nuts, seeds, veggies, and whole grains into our diet over highly processed ones. So now let's move on to the third type of fat called trans fat also sometimes known as hydrogenated fats or hydrogenated oils. Trans fats are essentially synthetic fats or man-made fats. Rarely are these types of fats found in natural foods. They were invented to initially turn liquid fats or oils into hardened fats like butter, but with a longer shelf life. Essentially, it allowed companies to produce cheaper alternatives to butter and lard using cheaper oils like soybean or cottonseed oil, which also could provide superior baking and cooking properties as well. However, over time, research started showing trans fats to be associated with increased rates of diseases such as obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, and type 2 diabetes. Because of this, the World Health Organization launched a plan to eliminate trans fat from the global food supply. In 2020, the United States actually banned the use of them in food. However, there still may be a small amount in certain processed foods, which can add up if you continue to consume these processed foods in excess. Okay, so I know that was a lot, but we've essentially covered the basic fundamentals of fat. You now probably know more about fat than 99.9% .9 of most people, making you a true fat expert. So no longer do you have to rely on others' opinions on what they think about fat and what you should be eating. You are now armed with the knowledge that can allow you to make your own independent health and nutrition decisions. So I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned something. And if you want to see more like this one, make sure to subscribe to my channel and turn on your notifications so you're always up to date on the latest nutrition and health information. If you want to get even smarter and healthier than you are right now, check out this video over here. All right, with that said, I will see you in the next video.